brother. Well, guys, it's really good to be with you. And, uh, you know, just in the little things you say, you kind of give yourself away. I haven't co- been called Brother Rick in a long time, so it tells me a little bit about your background. <laughs> because that's what we cut our teeth on. I mean, you had to do that, and I appreciate that. I mean, when we were growing up, you had to use that. Uh, and like, yes, ma'am, no ma'am, or uh, Miss Cheryl. My wife Cheryl is here. Cheryl was born and reared in Los Angeles. So, uh, man, when uh, she's over on this side of the country and the people are saying, Miss Cheryl, and yes, ma'am, that's just uh, so unusual to her, but give it up for Cheryl. She's a great wife, and uh, she could do a better job this morning than I could, um, and as you heard, my name is Rick, and you, you can call me that, you can call me Pastor Rick, call me Brother Rick, um, as long as you have a smile on your face, you can call me just about anything you want, I'm okay with that. And I am on staff at Our Journey Church Campus. Now, did you hear I said Our Journey Church Campus? Now, now how cool is that? Well, maybe not, huh? <laughs> well, I think it is, man. I, um, I, I grew up in the Jacksonville, Florida area, came to faith in 1975 in Nassau County, not far from where the concourse is. New Pastor Darrell before he was a Christ follower. So I got some good stories I could tell you about him. Tried to teach him as a teenager in in Sunday school class. I didn't know what I was doing. He didn't want to be there. It was horrible. So we got beyond those those memories, though. But I've I've lived in uh, South America. I've been in countries in South America, Central America, the Caribbean. I've been in churches all over across the United States. But this is the first time on this side of the creek. You know, when I go to South America, I go across the creek. So on this side of the creek, this is the first time I've been a part of a church that is actually multiplying campuses. And I love that, man. I think that's so cool to be a part of that. To me, it's very exciting. I hope it is for you. I know there's still, um, you know, some, some shock about, you know, what is going on. But I, I have learned this in life. If you'll just lean into God and trust him. My life passage is Proverbs 3, 5 through 12. But the first part of it, you guys know. You have to trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on. It's like a crutch. Don't lean on your own understanding. So you have a choice. Trust God with all your heart or you can lean on your own understanding. I have found my understanding will cause me to fall often. That crutch doesn't hold me up. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on on your own understanding in what? In all, all your ways. All your ways acknowledge him. Conditional promise. We were just singing about promises. Most of those promises are conditional. If you'll do this, here's what I'll do. So trust him in all your ways, all those intersections. Coming through Atlanta, Georgia. Three hours. Gosh. Man. I saw the same tag for over two hours. I was ready to lose. I really was. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll do what? He'll direct your path. That's a great, great promise. Don't ever forget that. Put that one into play. Just trust him. He really wants us to take a good journey. No pun intended, but yeah, it's a good word. Journey, that's why we have that. So I I am excited to be here with you. And you know that just like Journey Concourse is multiplying, did you know that God wants Journey Dallas to multiply? It is the biblical norm. And that's the truth. It really is. And speaking of truth, that's what we're talking about today in the four words. And um, I'm kind of watching back here. I, I kind of, I don't know, what time do you guys, where, did I lose? Okay, awesome. So somebody sent a runner down there to, is it Brittany? And tell her, <laughs> get some extra cookies. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding you, but listen, you know, it's a lot like coaching. I, I've coached, uh, man, I've coached actually since eighth grade. Long story there, but I love coaching. And your first day when you show up, and I've not seen you guys before, you know, you come with your game plan for coaching, but it's not until you kind of get a feel for what's there, you know what direction to go. So I have a manuscript I sent to uh, Jacob, uh, but I'm, I'm sure I'm going to kind of have to make some adjustments with that as I just kind of feel out where you guys are and go with, go with where, where God wants us to be. And I hope that today I want you to do this for me. Just lean into God. If you would, there's a lot, there are a lot of distractions, a lot of things you could be thinking of, 
both of us are in mourning today. You guys because of South Carolina, us because of LSU. So, you know, let's forget all of that and know that, that for whatever reason, God has brought us together. And I learned some years ago on the mission field, I was meeting in this place called uh, San Jose Jihidma. And this is a big old word, but anyway, it's a little city. It's a coastal city, and the travel is by boat. So the workers from this region called the Litorania, they would come to where I was at. And I was doing leadership training with them. And one day, Adonias, who was 80, and his wife, Clagey, she was about the same age. They weren't there, and they were always there. So I'm wondering, you know, what's going on? But we, we got into what we were doing. Later in the morning, about 10 or 11, they show up. And I, I didn't interrupt what I was doing, but I noticed they came in and they joined us. But then the bus started going around. And here's what, what I found out, is that that morning, the, the bus, not the, well, the boat, the bus, you know, you catch a boat like you would a bus, did, it wasn't running. This couple got a boat, a little wooden boat with oars, and this 80-year-old, he rowed for six hours, six hours to be where I was at. And I, and I used to, I, I grew up learning that you should kind of analyze what's the value of your meeting to those who are coming. You know, if it's going to be an hour of your time or two hours, how much money could you make in that? So make it a $100 meeting or whatever. That changed everything for me. I realized that, man, you know, when I show up somewhere and God has me to do something, it might be that somebody like Adonia, six hours, I hope it was worth it for him. And that's what I'm saying to you. I hope today is worth your being here for you because for us, it was a hellacious trip. I mean, we, we were in a shouting match getting on to 16. It wasn't fun driving. And then we had to deal with Atlanta. And then I'm suddenly, my, my voice is going. I'm getting this thing going on in my throat. And I'm coughing. And it's raining. And it's cold. I, I lived on the equator. I'm cold. And I'm realizing that Satan is battling this. So for whatever reason, I don't know why, but he has us here together today. So can we just kind of lean into God here and, and just listen? And we'll follow him, go wherever he wants us to go. But today we're, we're supposed to be working with the idea of truth. And uh, last week at our concourse campus, Kara, Pastor Daryl's wife, she taught and, and she brought some incredible truth on the word grace. Uh, grace was our first word, truth, today, and then I think we're dealing with love and breath. Uh, and she kind of gave this illustration. It is that, and, and probably has happened to all of us, maybe not some of you younger ones, but the rest of us, have you ever ended up with dog poo on your shoe? <laughs> and you're smelling something, and you go, what is that? And only to find out it's you, and you're the one who needs a little bit of grace? But that kind of says it all the way our message went last week. Often we find that we're the one who really needs the grace, and we do. And that's where she took it. I think for me, one of the best pictures of grace that God has shown me in recent years is the Exodus account out of Egypt. You know, the Israelites were enslaved 430 years. Can't even wrap my brain around that one. 430 years they're enslaved. The most powerful nation on the planet owns them, controls them. They have no hope. They're stuck. Until God sends an outsider, kind of sounds like what he did for us. He sent an outsider, sent Moses from out in. And then God went on display with all these signs and wonders, just like he did in the ministry of Christ, only to have Moses finally, because of, you know the thing that set him free? Do you remember what it was? On that night, the death angel passed over. They had to kill a lamb, drain its blood, put the blood on the doorposts and the lintel of their home, and every home covered by the blood of the lamb was spared death, and that's what set them free. It's a great picture of grace. That was all free of charge. There was nothing they could do to make that happen. God did that for them. That's grace, and that's what he's done for us. That's where somebody somewhere would say, hey, man, yeah, somebody would get excited. That's what he did for us. We were hopelessly enslaved. The enemy controlled us. I don't know about you. He did me. And at age 21, man, he set me free. He set me free by his grace. Nothing I could do. He set me free. Only thing I could do is what they did. 
respond. I responded to the door that he opened for me. But now they're in the wilderness. And now what? Grace has set them free. And by God's grace, he continues to guide them and lead them and provide for them. But they needed guidelines for living. They had no clue. How do a free people live? How do a redeemed people live? And God began to give to them through Moses guidelines for living. And over and over and over in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, you're going to find God saying this. I love you. I'm the God who rescued you out of Egypt. And I want you to do well. I want you to be successful wherever you go. So just follow my guidelines. And that is truth. He had Moses write them down. Or Moses had someone write them down. But over you, and over, you see, write these things down so that you will always have truth. Because they're guidelines. They're guidelines. They're guidelines to help you do well, to succeed. And so that is, that is why truth, and it was inseparably linked to grace. And in our day, you know, we, we go, well, where do we find truth? And we think about Jesus, and, and I see a lot of movements where we want to be all about grace, and we should. It's like someone asked me one time, what about evangelism and discipleship? Which do you go for? Both. They're both there. And there, it's like a coin with two sides. We must always be evangelizing, but if we are evangelizing well, we are making disciples. That's what Jesus said to do, right? So you can't separate those two. Grace and truth, same thing. They are, they are connected together. And the Bible says in John 1.14, John 1.14, that, and we should have this, there it is. Look at this, the Word. Now, you guys know who the Word is from verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And he goes on to say that everything that was made, that, that is made, that's out there, that we can see or not see, was made by the Word. And then he says, just to clarify, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son, so we know who that is, right? Who is that? That's Jesus, who came from the Father. Look at this. Full of what? Grace and truth. He brought both. And we cannot let go of either one. Jesus brought grace and truth. Now, so today, though, we're looking at truth. It was uh, 1998. Where I, where I live most of my time in Brazil, if you're looking at the map and you're looking at the mouth of the Amazon River, come down about an inch on the map, about a day's drive, the city of San Luis. And uh, living there, we were, most of my work was in the lower Amazon basin and travel was horrific. I mean, it, it trumped Atlanta. You, you could, I've put my Volkswagen van in a pothole and reached out and touched the asphalt. That's how serious potholes are. And that was the major highway. So it, travel was tough. To get to Carutapera was an all-day drive. Or in the airplane, we could be there in like an hour, hour 15. So we had an airplane project. This, man, this friend of mine, Carlos, and, and, and I, we had this. It was his dream, and it, occur, it happened called ICTUS, you know, the old acronym, the fish acronym, I-K-T-U-S. And um, we were coming back this day from Carutapera, and when we took off on the dirt strip, Pastor Bruce who was the, uh, the pilot, and I call him that. You see, my, my roots, Pastor Bruce, when he was a little bit older, he had grown up and lived in Brazil, and now he's returned as a missionary, a volunteer pilot for us in this project. He got this plane up. He's in the front, Carlos. Dr. Ivan, or Ivan, is here, and I'm here. And we barely clear those trees. And so close was it that I, I actually lifted my feet trying to help this thing get up. We got up over the trees, and Bruce said, man, next time, we're not carrying so, so much weight. And I agreed. I'm like, dude, I'll stay behind next time. I don't need this. I don't care that much about flying in these things. And so anyway, he's banking. He's headed back towards San Luis. And I saw him fiddling with the portable GPS he had brought with him. And it wasn't working. There's a phenomenon on the equator that occasionally they call it bubbles. They do. They literally say bubbles in the atmosphere. It knocks out all radio and satellite transmission. So GPS is dead in the water and the radio is dead. But that's no problem. We have a full instrument panel, and we can, we can go. But in a little while, this little red AV light hmm, popped on on the dash. I had not a clue. I'm not a pilot. Found out later it's the vacuum pump had broken. Now, that's no big, big deal, right? We're not going to vacuum the plane flying it back, so who needs a vacuum pump? Except it operates every instrument in that dash. 
except the manual, the needle and ball, which will work no matter what. So because I'm watching it one time, and you've got these wings that help you with the horizon, and they're like this. And I'm thinking, dude, this guy's really good, man. He's flying us like this, and I can't even tell it. And, uh, man, all of a sudden, you know, we're, but we're okay because we can see for the moment. And then we got socked in. And we can't see anything. And Bruce had a map. He had a ruler. He had uh, his watch and maybe a pencil. And he's doing his thing. That, those are the only instruments that he had to make this thing work. It got so bad at one time, Carlos, who also is a pilot, he's in the right front seat, he had his map upside down. And he's arguing with Bruce about the direction we need to go. And Bruce just calmly stuck to the course. And Dr. Ivan and I, we had already agreed, we're dead. We're dead. And we knew it. We resigned. We're dead. And we're bouncing. We can't see. And I'm about to lose it. And Bruce is calmly navigating. And then, boom, we broke out of the clouds. And we weren't, no longer was there turbulence shaking the plane. It was a celebration of Dr. Ivan and I in the back. And there it was, the island of San Luis, and it was clear sky, and we got back, we dropped off Ivan and Carlos, and, and Bruce turned to me and he said, Rick, a scale of 1 to 10, difficulty level, that's 10. It's no worse than that. And then he said, Rick, you've got to learn to trust your instruments. You've got to trust your instruments. They are the only thing that's telling you the truth. You've got to trust them. You've got to know, know how to identify what's truth. Carlos was saying this is truth. He has map all upside down, and I could see that. So I knew that wasn't right, and he said, you've got to know truth, two things. You've got to know truth, but just knowing it wasn't enough, was it? We had to follow it. We had to know truth. We had to follow it. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today is knowing truth and following it because on that day, knowing truth and following it literally, literally saved our lives, and that's, that's why I'm here today. So the first question is, is what is truth? What is truth? And really, I would kind of rephrase that, and I have thought in my mind, but I, did, I didn't send uh, Caleb the, the update. But it really, I, I think the question would be, where do I find truth? Where do I find truth? And you can take the secular approach. You might see that on the screen. And that is that truth is perspective. It, it means your vantage point from the way that I see it. It's your opinion. And years ago, I was a longshoreman right out of high school working the docks in Jacksonville. And I was taught that everybody, that opinions are like armpits. Everybody has two, and they both stink. So, you know, if you want, you can go with someone's opinion. But then you're still left with the question, like on that day, who's right? So if you want to take that approach, you're you're rolling the dice to me. And then the other is a scientific approach. People take this, and they've got to be able to see it to believe that it's truth. If I can't see it, then it's not true. But here's the problem. Do you know that the tithe doesn't work here? There's no way that 90% is ever more than 100% scientifically. But what they don't realize is that if you have 10 kernels of corn, the guy with nine, he's better off. Because the guy with nine planted that one, that's the tithe. He planted one. One kernel of corn planted. You've got to give it up. Now you only have nine, but this guy's got ten. But one stalk will grow, two ears of corn, that has between 400 and 600 kernels on it each ear. Who's better off? The guy with nine. See, so the scientific approach crashes and burns in the face of faith. You've got to believe the corn is going to grow. In the face of faith, you, you lose on the scientific. What about the spiritual approach? And I would, I would change that a little bit, too, to call it the church tradition approach. So here's why this doesn't work. You know, you guys aren't a church. You know why? Look at this place. This isn't a church building with a steeple. Church tradition says you're not a church unless you have a church building and a steeple. And you guys violated the, the, the mother of all laws because you didn't start at 945. And 11. I'm serious. I've been in some huge battles because we were trying to adjust the 945 Sunday school to 10 to, to, for our people to engage our culture. That's one of our things that we're all about at the Journey Church. We're about engaging our culture. And we try to do that in a traditional church. And tradition, tradition is law. Tradition is truth. 
I went to Brazil, and I've, I've fallen into this trap. I couldn't understand in northeast Brazil why Sunday morning, forget it. There's not going to be anybody there. There would be some children and some ladies, and there would be Sunday school, and that was about it. And I'm like, dude, what are you guys doing? Why don't you have worship, or we call it experience, on Sunday morning? Well, I found out that in northeast Brazil that almost everyone works six days a week. They're up very early. They work, work long into the night. And Sunday morning is the only opportunity any of them have to sleep in a little bit. And it is stinking hot. By the time you get to 11 o'clock in the morning, it is hot. And there's no AC. So it just makes sense to go at night. Think about it. So tradition can derail you. And, and I even, they, they derailed me because in some of those who had changed all of our tradition, they insisted that for me to speak, I had to wear a tie and a coat. My shoes are filling up with sweat, but I got to have a tie and a coat on. Tradition. It, it'll sink your ship. So those aren't ways. So how do you? I think the best way for me, I, in 1975, I decided this for myself, the scripture approach. I just believe that the Bible was the word of God. And when we allow it to be our source of truth, we come to see that Jesus is the embodiment of truth. For example, you'll find that truth is a person. Look with me at John 1.14. We just did. The word became flesh. Who, who is that, the word? You said it. It's Jesus. He became flesh and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So truth is a, is a person, and God's word is truth. Look at John 17, 17. He, Jesus is praying for us, for his disciples, and for those who believe in him without having seen him. That would be us. And he says, Father, sanctify them by the truth, and what? Your word. Your word is truth. And truth, and this is where I want to go today, truth has transformational power. Look with me at John 8, 31 through 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, you'll know the truth, and the truth will do what? It'll set you free. You see the promise here? Another conditional promise. If you will, then here's what will happen. You'll be set free. So I want to unpackage this. Let's start with the very first phrase, if you. That's the optional word. Do you know what that means to all of us? It means you have a choice. You don't have to do this. It's a divide in the road for you. And you can choose to do what he's going to say, or you can choose not to. He gives you the freedom to do that, and it's up to you. So if you, if you what? This is the operative word. If you abide in my word. Now, that's, that's an old King James term, abide in my word, the, it's the operative word, and it, it's the idea of dwelling. You make the word your dwelling place. You're going you're gonna to live there. I like, I like the Portuguese rendition of this. They have a word that's a verb. It's our word permanent. But they have it in a verb form. So, for example, I permanent, she permanents, you permanent. I mean, they, they conjugate this verb. And the picture here, the way they say this, is that it's the idea of if you will be permanent, but if you will be permanently firm, permanent firm in the word. So imagine, if you will, anybody in here been through a hurricane? I've, I've done, I mean, I'm talking serious hurricane. And for just a few hours, man, you think everything's going to get blown away. But if you're in a good location, what do you do? You stay there. I can't imagine Try to wrap your brain around 40 hours, Hurricane Dora, sitting right over this building. 40 hours. That's what happened in the Bahamas. 40 hours. I can't imagine that. And there's no doubt, it's just like Jurassic Park. You see those guys hunkered down in that safe or that bunker, and one of them, he's, you just, he's just dying to run. He's going to run. And you're knowing, dude, dude don't run. Because if you run in just a second, we're going to see just your feet dangling from the mouth of the T-Rex. But what does he do? He runs. And he's dangling from the mouth of the T-Rex. So what this word is saying to us, it's saying, if you will be permanently firm, permanently firm in his word, doesn't matter what current comes along that's trying to draw you away. doesn't matter what storm has settled in on you. And some storms of life are far greater than 40 hours. No matter what comes your way, stay permanently 
firm in what? In the word, because that's what that is moves. His word will not move. It cannot pass away. It cannot be blown away. So he says to stay there. And if you do, look at this next phrase. You are truly my disciples. You see, being saved, being born again, being a Christ follower is a prerequisite of understanding the truth of Scripture. Those who don't know Jesus, the Bible's just foolishness. You see, 1975, I'm 21 years old. I'm not long back from Hawaii. I had gone there to pursue my dream to be world champion surfer uh, because I had grown up surfing the beaches of Jacksonville, thinking that prepared me for Hawaii. (laughs) That was stupid. So I didn't know the truth. But I'm back, and I was lost as can be, just a hippie surfer, Volkswagen van, the whole bit. And uh, I encountered Jesus. And I gave my life to him in a place just like this. Yeah, I was on right there, that side. And I just said, hey, I know I need to surrender to you. And there were no fireworks or anything, but here's what happened. Crazy thing happened. All of a sudden, I really felt the desire to read the Bible. Someone directed me toward the New Testament, so I started with Matthew. The weirdest thing, it made sense. I tried before, it never made any sense. Like, th- these are just words. They don't, what are they saying? Suddenly it made sense. This guy Jesus was real. And he did some incredible things, and I was beginning to get to know him. And then when I got to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I understood why it made sense. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. You got that, Caleb? If not, we'll push on without it. That's okay. Listen up. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And he can't understand them because they're spiritually uh, appraised or discerned, the old King James. You understand them through the Spirit, and you can't. So you see, the only way that you can understand truth in Scripture is to be a Christ follower. So I'd encourage you to do what I did. If you haven't done that yet, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, I know I'm lost. I know I need you. I know I need to be what you said to, to Nicodemus. I need to be born again. And I, and I want that. That's what I did. I want that. I want to surrender my life to you. So would you forgive me? I'm a sinner. I know that. I didn't need convincing of that. Then you can do that. And I would encourage you to do that because then suddenly your eyes are opened. And then you can understand truth. And I did. That's the litmus test for a, a Christ follower, a disciple, is, is this person abiding in the Word? You guys understand the litmus test, what that is? When I, when I worked the docks, we shipped all the milk products to Puerto Rico. They all came through our gates. If, if it was going to Puerto Rico, it came through our gates. And the milk, how do you know if the milk is okay or if it's going bad or we don't want to ship milk that's going to be cottage cheese when it gets there? What do you do? You open one carton. I always loved it when they had opened the chocolate milk carton because once they test it, they want to give it away, and I was right there for it. So... You stick that litmus paper in, and you pull it out. And depending on the color, it tells you whether it's good or bad. The litmus test for Christianity and Christ's follower, am I abiding in his word? Have I made it my permanent place? I'm going to be permanently firm in his word. We look at a lot of things, but Jesus said, if you're permanently firm in my word, you're truly my disciple. If you think about it. So that's what opens the door. And if you do that, you're permanently my disciple. But look at this. There are some dynamic results. Here comes the, the promise part. And, or it could be then. And here are the dynamic results. You ready? The first result is you will know the truth. You will know the truth. Bingo. You see, we're talking about truth. And where do you find it? Jesus said, if you're permanently in my word, you're firm in it, you'll know the truth. You'll know it. And now, this, this word know is really cool because... In our language, we have one word for no. No. Do I know you? I don't yet. I haven't seen you. Don't know you. But in, in the uh, Portuguese, it would use saber, the know, I know things. But conhecer is the word, the verb for I know you. I know you because I've met you. In fact, it's the no that's used in the Bible that, you know, when the children are around, they say that, uh, you know, Adam knew his wife Eve, and, and then uh, who was born? Give me a name. Cain and Abel were born. I mean, he knew his wife, okay? 
That's the idea of getting to know. You experience. It's this experiential knowing. Abraham knew Sarah. Okay, and that's all they have to say because when they use that word, they know, okay. We know what's, what no is all about here. No is experientially knowing. For example, we're in Bowling Green the other day. We have uh, in-laws there. And Dick Longobardo is 91 years old, soon to be. And he's a master mechanic in his barn, he calls it. He has a lift. And so while I'm there, why not change the oil in, our, in Cheryl's Honda CRV and transmission fluid? So when it came time for the transmission fluid, I'm supposed to have it warmed up. And it wasn't. It was cold. So he and I talked. Master mechanic, 91 years old, been doing this his whole life, never done anything else. And we talk about it, and we go, yeah, here's what we can do. We've got it on the lift. We'll start it up, put it in gear. And you and I, okay, we'll chat a while, drink a little coffee. And when the transmission is warmed up, we'll shut it off and change it. <laughs> Some of you probably know. Do you know what happens to your car when it hits 10 miles per hour? Doors lock. <laughs> Yeah, dude, we had truth all figured out, but experience taught us. Yeah, no, no, that's not, that's not true. You can't do that. I, I went uh, nuclear. I had to go outside the barn for a little while. And it um, cost me 100 bucks with a, a locksmith and a whole lot of other problems that we could have solved <laughs> if I had just not been nuclear. Another reason we don't know the truth, we sort of deviate from it. I, didn't, I wasn't permanently firm in his words. So it was a nightmare. But experience, you see, so you've got to experientially know, and that's what he's talking about. You will experientially know the truth. It's not here. You experience truth. Because remember, truth is a person. And you experience him as you stay permanently firm in his word. And look what will happen. The truth will do what? Will set you free. I remember when I ran across that in John 8 as I was reading through for the first time. I saw that, and I realized, man, I'm, I'm a Christ follower. I knew that. And I realized, but I got all these chains that are just all over me. I got all this baggage, this junk. And there's the solution. He said, if you'll be permanently firm in my word, you'll know the truth, and truth will set you free. It'll liberate you. Jews understood that. Remember, they were in Egypt 430 years. They knew what slavery was. And during this time, the Romans occupied their country. They wanted nothing more than to be liberated from that. They didn't understand that the, it was so much more than that. They didn't realize it. For example, if we were to look at uh, 2 Timothy 2, this this liberation is so much greater than even uh, another country dominating us and being set free from that. But in 2 Timothy 2, now in this, Paul is talking to Timothy about making disciples. And he is talking about arguments and avoiding arguments. Man, could we ever learn from that one? Stay away from arguments. And here's, here's what he says. you got to... The opponents, those who oppose you, they're arguing about this truth or whatever it is. He said, your opponent must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. There's that word, knowledge, experiential knowledge of the truth. Now look at this, that they will come to their senses. They will escape the trap of what? The devil, the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Do you see that without truth in our lives, there are areas of our lives and maybe our entire being, we can be enslaved to the enemy because we haven't been liberated by truth. We're enslaved. We're in cages. And that's why Jesus said, if if you will be permanently firm in my word, it shows that you're a disciple. And you will experientially know, you will experience, you'll encounter truth. And the truth will liberate you, will set you free. You don't have to carry that baggage around. He will set you free from that. Man, he's been doing that. He's still doing that. But he's been doing that from 1975 to now. He's been setting me free. So you see, knowing truth is so important to all of us. But here's the, here's the big deal. All right, so I know it. But what do I do with it? That's the second thing. How do I find truth? But what do I do with truth once I find it? Do you know that Jesus said, that unapplied truth is destructive. If you think about it, we're going to look at it right now, the Sermon on the Mount. So we're in Matthew 7, Sermon on the Mount, and he finishes that, but he wraps it up. If you've ever sat in any preaching, how many of you have been in preaching for a good while? You've, you've sat under good, good preachers. Okay. Uh, you don't have to consider this one a good one, but 
uh, you know, the, the good ones, here's what they do. Their closing illustration, isn't that the thing that where they pull it all together and they wrap it all up? So Jesus is finishing what many say, the greatest sermon ever recorded. And so his closing illustration is what you see here. Take a look at this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will uh, enter the kingdom of heaven. This is not it. I need 24 through 27. Can you jump down to that? This one came before. This is one I'm going to skip. And here's the one I want to look at. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does what? Puts them into practice. You see that? Puts them into practice. Does it? Is like what kind of man? A wise man. And you guys know the story. He built his house on the rock. And the rain came. The streams rose. Winds blew. It was kind of like a hurricane. And beat against that house. Yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. But, but, everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Does not put them into practice. Is like what kind of man? A foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, streams rose, winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. What was the difference between these two guys? Yeah, between the two houses was the foundation. What was the difference between the two men? They both heard the same sermons. They both went to the same student camps. They both went to the same Bible studies. They both did the same seminars, group meetings, the whole gamut. But one did what? Put it into practice. He put into play what he learned. And that's what became that foundation of his life. That's why his house didn't fall. Jesus said, if you don't put truth into practice, it's coming down on your head. That's a promise. It's all going to come down on your head. You've got to put it into play. You have to put truth into practice. Now, listen to what some of you know this guy, A.W. Tozer. He's from days back, great writer. He said, let me boldly, let me say boldly, it's not the difficulty of discovering truth, but the unwillingness to obey it that makes it, makes it so rare among, what, among men. Let me read that again. It's not the difficulty of discovering truth, but the unwillingness to obey it that makes it so rare among men. So why are people... So unwilling to obey the truth. One thing I think is this, TMI. Everybody get that? I, I had to ask Cheryl, what does that mean, TMI? Too much information, all right? Dawson is my 15-year-old grandson, and uh, he's going to be driving in March. So you just think Atlanta traffic is bad. Go to Fernandina in March when Dawson and Gabby, his 18-year-old sister, are driving. You might want to take a bumper car, okay? So he's going to be driving. What we did is we found him at a great deal. Man, God provided a sweet deal on this 2002 uh, Chevy Silverado 1500 HD. I mean, it, it's a sweet thing. He got it for a song because, I thought, piece of cake. It needs brake lines. Chevy just put in poor brake lines back in that era, and they're rusted, and the brake fluid's all running out. No brakes, zero brakes. So how hard can that be? <laughs> So hard that Guy Wiley, and you guys will probably get to meet him. He's our production guy. He is really, he's a cool guy, old guy. So he sends me a video, YouTube video. I love YouTube videos. One hour long YouTube video. One hour. Who the heck's going to give an hour to a YouTube video? Yeah, okay, you would do it. Man, I'm like, there's got to be a 10-second one. You know, a couple of minutes. So, so you know, that's the problem with, with Scripture often. People look at that, and that's a lot of information. It's a ton of information. But why did Guy Wiley give me a one-hour video? Because it was the most comprehensive one that he knew was out there, and it was the one that would help me. And had I just ignored it, because that's what we do a lot with Scripture, because there's so much information, ignore it. I'm just moving on with life. I'm going to live life. I'm going to change the brake lines, but I'm just going to do it, man. I've done enough life. I think I can figure it out, and we move forward. Big mistake would have been for me because watch the video and the guy said, you have, to have, you have to have a special wrench. I'm like, special wrench? I've got a 9 16 open end and that'll work on those brake lines, no problem. He said, no, that's a big problem because they're so corroded that using an open end wrench, you're going to wring them off 
you're going to damage your master cylinder or damage the ABS module, and now you're out a whole lot more money. He said, you've got to have a special wrench. It was a closed end, but it had a slot cut that would fit over the line. You slide it up on the nut. I'm like, okay, cool. I need a special wrench. I have to go buy it. Here's what God does. He shows us truth, but often he provides. That morning before we started that project, Dawson hadn't gotten there yet. Cheryl and I are walking around outside with a cup of coffee, just kind of enjoying the morning. David Williamson comes by, Journey Church guy, member of our Journey Church, right? So David Williamson comes by and says, hey, Rick, what are you doing? He's a contractor, and I told him what I was going to do, and I said, I just got to run and get this special wrench. He goes, I got a special wrench. <laughs> Isn't that cool how God provides? So I've got a special wrench now. See, that, and that's why we, we have to, we can't just plunge ahead. You know, but, but we sometimes ignore it. But here's another thing that people do. With, there's so much information in the Bible, just like with that video. They choose their special topics. Like, uh, I just love changing spark plugs. Man, I've changed so many spark plugs, Dawson. Why don't we just watch some videos on changing spark plugs, and we'll focus on that. That's great. You'll have a good running motor, but, you know, if your brakes don't stop you, something will. That's going to be a serious problem. Or, or what about dude perfect changing filters? That's awesome. Have you ever seen dude perfect changing car filters? I mean, they flip it from their kitchen, and somehow it lands in the, in the truck just where it needs to be. You know, when we could have done all of that, but the brakes still wouldn't have got fixed. And that's how some people approach Scripture. They've got their famous ones they always go to, or those little clips, and they hit all of that. But the thing, the brake lines never get changed, and they wonder why they crash. But the information was there all along. You see, it's a big, big fail when we just focus on our favorite topics. Here's a passage I ran across a few years ago in Hebrews 6. I went through a period of time in my life, I really couldn't, uh, I couldn't study. It was in such a dark place. Storm. So I had to go to the message translation. I really needed it dummy down for me. And um, I kind of thought, hey, this is pretty cool. Eugene Peterson did a good job of this. Here's what he says in Hebrews 6. He says, so come on. Let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. All right. It's the South Carolina campus, and all the football players are in fing the preschool finger painting class over here. And there's a fine arts department over here, but none of those football players can get over there. They're still finger painting, okay? I'm trying to help you feel better, because uh, that's what I'm thinking about LSU today. But the challenge is to us, he's talking about us, and he says, come on, guys, we've been in the finger painting class way too long. There's a grand work of art over here, and we need to, we need to get across campus. Look what he says. He says, grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths, these are those favorite clips we all like to go to. These, these basic foundational truths are in place. For example, turning your back on salvation by self-help and turning in trust toward God. You know, what is salvation? That's a favorite topic today. A lot of books written on that. Or how about this one? Um, baptismal instructions. What is baptism? When do you do it? What should it look like? A lot of, lot of good clips on that. Or what about this one? Laying on of hands. What are spiritual gifts? So a lot, again, a lot of good clips, a lot of books. Resurrection of the dead. How's that going to play out? Eternal judgment. What's going to be happening at end times? You see the favorite clips? And they had them in their day. And then he says, God helping us. We'll stay true to all that. That's not changing. But look what he says. Read that with me. But what? But there's so much more. And they look at the challenge. Let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Digging out truth. So don't just, if I could say anything to you, and I, and I see this all the time. Cheryl and I do a lot of counseling. You know, we're getting old. They call me Yoda, around, whatever that means. And we do a lot of counseling, and we talk to people, and we talk to people, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's their marriage is crashing and burning. So we have two questions we start right up front with. You know, are you in the Word? You know, you know what the answer is. Don't you? No. And then we ask, are you, are you praying? You know the answer. No. But they don't understand why there's a storm. They don't understand why they're crashing and burning. And so, you see, we've, we've got, we can't just focus on the popular topics. We've got to get after it. Cheryl, I left one thing. I've got to grab one thing, and I'm wrapping up. I promise you, I'm finishing. All right. I only have about 30 more minutes. All right. 
Here's another reason that I'm confident in our day that people, um, they, they turn their back on Scripture and they don't want to hear it. And I would, I would call it this. You guys know what that means, don't you? It's the thumbs down approach. Because here's what it is. Some people see the Bible this way. And that's all it is. All they hear is thumbs down. All they focus on are words like don't, avoid, stay away from. And they hear a very negative message. And when they read the Bible, this is what they see. They see that. And they hear it taught, they think. They hear other Christ followers, and all they're doing is this. And they receive a negative message. They hear condemnation. The worst case scenario, they hear hatred. Because that's the message that they think is out there. For example, I'm talking with Dawson as we're working, and there are a lot of don'ts. If you've got a 15-year-old who's soon going to be driving, you've got some don'ts, right? So here was one of my don'ts. It's a Chevy truck. Dawson, when you pull into the gas station, and you're going to fuel this thing up, do not grab the hose that says D-I-E-S-E-L. This is a gas truck. Don't put diesel in it. He said, but he, see, he could have heard that as a, as a negative and gone, but Grandpa, wait a minute. My best friend has a Chevy truck, and he puts diesel in his, and he says it gets better fuel mileage, and I love the way that thing sounds and how it belches out black smoke, so forget you. I'm putting, I'm putting diesel in it. And you know where that would go, right? But all he heard was don't, 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 don't. And you see, I could have done that with that video because the guy was telling me, don't use this wrench. He had a lot of don'ts. Was he being negative? He was doing what God does for us. You see, when you read through the Old Testament and when you look at the whole truth, you will see that God is saying, I love you. I love you. I rescued you from your Egypt. I did that by the death of my son, Jesus. And I provide for you. I take care of you because I love you. And I'm giving you some guidelines. These guidelines will ensure that you live a great life. And that wherever you go, you will prosper. Now, if we hear all of this, we may just plunge in and do it our way. Or we stay with our favorite clips that have none of this. It's all so upbeat. But what we have to grab hold of and realize is that God, He loves us. He loves us. And the reason that He gives us truth, it isn't that He's, he's condemning us. God wants it to go well with you. He really does. So I want to close on that. Grace is what sets us free and gives us things that, man, we don't even deserve the good things. But His truth, His truth guides us. His truth sets us free. And I'm still being set free. I know all of you are still being set free. You don't have to carry baggage. You don't have to deal with any of it. God is all about liberating and setting you free because here's what He wants for you. And that's why this church probably will multiply because the community needs to know this, right? This is the message the community needs. They need to know that God is, is for them and God is for you and God is for me. And so the beginning place, though, is this, where I did. Remember, if you've not given your life to Jesus and you, you know, I don't know, but you know, that's where it begins. And it's, it's in place because it's the launching pad. And he loves you, and he is drawing you. If you know that and you sense that, the Bible is very clear. He's drawing you to that. And I, I'm not going to ask you to do anything with that except obey it. I'm not going to ask you to do anything here. Obey it. Do it. I did it on my own volition. I knew I needed it. And God saved me and transformed my life. And so that's the first thing. Second thing, please determine that you will be permanently firm in his word. Don't worry about it being TMI. He'll guide you through it. He'll show you what he wants you to see. Don't skip the stuff that looks so boring and go to the do perfect Bible and just whatever that looks like. But get in there and let him talk to you because those are the areas where he is going to break the chains in your life. And he's going to set you free. And the one that the Lord has set free is free indeed. So let me pray with you. Father, today we thank you most of all for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to come into our world, lay aside all that you were and come into our world to die for us. 
and to be resurrected and to offer us eternal life, but also abundant life, that it can go well for us and we can prosper wherever we go. We can be successful. Thank you that you've made that available to us. But you have asked us to follow you. You have said it in a way that is to be permanently firm in your word. And I pray over all of us in this room that we would determine today that that's what we're going to do. Whatever that requires, we're going to do that. And as a result of that, you've said you'll set us free. And for this, we thank you and we praise you today. And we pray this in your name, Jesus.